Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. It's Thursday, November 12, 2020. Um, and I can't help but reflect as we're coming towards the end of the course, how much has changed since we started around September 1st. And during that period, it was unclear what direction the pandemic would take. But we're living through a phase right now of an intense surge, the highest numbers in the United States and in other countries that we've seen during the whole pandemic. This last week, there were more than 140,000 cases each day. And yesterday, for example, 140,000 new cases and 1,400 deaths. So we're heading into a perilous time, but not one without any hope as everybody's been reading. And I think we've all been following the Pfizer vaccine. Looks like it will be declared effective and safe and may even be available for some before the end of this year. Um, today, we want to think more about this idea of a pandemic as a moving target and to focus in on some of the unbelievably profound economic consequences that it has had already and that it's likely to have, at least in the intermediate period going forward. And as you know, and we've discussed, there's been a lot of attention to the idea of public health or economy, lockdown or mitigate. But what I think we're seeing at this stage of the pandemic is the notion that the economy, public health mitigation are intertwined in incredibly complex ways. This makes it hard to understand, hard to study. It's hard to reduce any single variable it's hard to make the most effective trade-offs in terms of how to um, stabilize and restore the economy, and at the same time, address the fundamental public health issues of reducing illness and death associated with COVID. So we'll be taking up some of those questions with a remarkably distinguished, experienced group of economists who have been thinking criti critically about the pandemic but before we do that, we have a quick poll. Um, and so, Yvonne, if you could put that up, that would be great. The first is actually a classic multiple choice question to see if you all know the answer. This is not something I actually knew in advance, unfortunately. Um, and then the others were, are more um, personal ones. Let me just take a look at this second one. There's some confidence here that by 2022, we'll be doing much better. And interestingly, two thirds of your families are revising their plans for Thanksgiving. Let me just say a word or two um, about the first question. The answer from the Cutler Summers paper, which appeared in what's called JAMANET, the Journal of the American Medical Association, is that they estimated the costs of the pandemic at 16 trillion. So just over 15 trillion. And it's just a unbelievable number. And they commented in their article, just what that really constitutes. And they added up a lot of different variables from loss of life and disability to the impact on the service economy, work, labor, manufacturing, and came up with this number of 16 trillion. And there's an article that quotes David Cutler in this morning's Gazette. And he says, that's like a hurricane happening as a national event across the country, as opposed to in one region. So it really does indicate some of the critical aspects of the current moment um, from an economic point of view. I have to say the literature right now suggests that small groups at home and especially larger groups have been one of the principal contributors to the surge in the pandemic. So the idea that two thirds of you 
we'll have perhaps smaller Thanksgivings this year is reassuring and there will be a lot of discussion about that in the, this time through the holidays in December and into January. So let me turn it over to Ingrid and we really have a great group to pursue some of these questions in greater depth. Thank you so much, Alan. And um, we have just luminaries in the field today. We're, we're so fortunate to have three phenomenal speakers. You may only notice one of our three on your screen right now. Um, that is because one of our speakers is actually teaching a class at this moment. He has pre-recorded his um, conversation with you all. And then he'll be popping in here at the end of this He's very generously coming in as soon as his class ends to come and join us. And our third speaker is also going to be arriving a bit late. So let me introduce all three to you now, um, and then we will um, hear from all three of them sequentially over the course of our time together. So our first speaker, who as I mentioned has pre-recorded his remarks is Professor Eric Maskin. He is the Adams University professor and professor of economics and mathematics at Harvard. He's really been a leading scholar in his contributions to game theory, contract theory, social choice theory, political economy, and really a diverse array of areas in economics. And perhaps one of his uh, areas that he's most known for is that in 2007, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for really laying the foundations of mechanistic design theory. And I was um, reviewing his bio and one of the things I actually found incredibly heartening and hopefully relevant to you all here as undergraduates is in his Nobel acceptance speech, he actually discussed the importance of his undergraduate education here at Harvard University and the impact of his training and his professors in um, an area called information economics. And he actually said, that this work was, um, I'll just quote him, a revelation since it had the precision, the rigor, and sometimes the beauty of pure mathematics and also addressed problems of real social importance, what he described as an irresistible combination. And he's really been a leader of critical thought um, and particularly during this time, the impact of COVID on uh, our economy and financial and policy strategies for addressing current economic conditions. So we will be hearing from Professor Maskin again um, via video and then he'll come and join us at the end for your questions. Our second speaker today is Professor Karen Dynan, who is physically present with us. Thank you, Professor Dynan. She's a professor of the practice in the Department of Economics here at Harvard. She has extensive experience in government. She has served as the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and the Chief Economist at the US Department of Treasury from 2014 to 2017, leading analyses of economic conditions and development of policies to address the nation's economic challenges. She's also um, been the Vice President and Co-Director of Economic Studies Programs at the Brookings Institute and served on the staff of the Federal Reserve Board for over 17 years and has played a leadership in a leadership role in a number of these areas, including um, macroeconomic forecasting, household finances, and the federal response to financial crisis. So we can think of no one better to be here today to be thinking about the role that the federal government can be playing in the context of this global pandemic, particularly um, in terms of providing aid and support and thinking about all of the ramifications of, um, of the COVID pandemic. So we're thrilled to have you here today. And then our third speaker will be joining us as well. She'll be popping in um, a little bit later. This is Professor Gita Gopinath. She is the um, John Zwanstera Professor of International Studies and Economics at Harvard. And she is actually currently on leave, you can see her here. This is actually, according to my son, would be the most important thing she's done is be on The Daily Show. Um, but she also happens to have a very important role, which is that she's on leave right now from the economics department to serve as the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, or what we know as the IMF. And in her role there, she's the director of IMF's research department and economic counselor on the fund. 
And as many of you know, one of the key roles of the IMF is to provide loans to countries in need of economic support. And some of the things that she has discussed during this time is that it has the COVID pandemic has um, unleashed a global um, economic crisis of unprecedented proportions. And she has a really unique window into the economic impacts of this pandemic, both the, the health consequences, the direct health consequences of this pandemic, but also the public health measures like lockdowns that have had on the economic well-being, particularly of um, low, lower resource settings globally. So she's going to be speaking to us from a discussion point or a platform really focused much more on the global economic impacts. So really three luminaries in the field. We are so thrilled to have them all here today. We're going to start with Professor Maskin's um, video for all of us that he taped just last week. So it's, it's fresh and relevant and we'll get to hear him speak right now. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Maskin. I'd like to tell you a bit about the economics of a pandemic. Uh, I don't have to persuade you that the United States has a remarkably successful economy uh, and has had such a successful economy for many, many years now. Uh, Americans have an enormous range of goods that they can choose from. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most people can get all they need of essential goods like food, clothing, and housing. There, there are important exceptions here. There are uh, far too many poor people who, who can't get all these goods, but by and large, people can fulfill their needs. And an important reason for this is our market system. Uh, first, uh, people can sell their services, sell their labor on the market to earn income. This is what we call earning a wage or a salary. Uh, and then they can use this income to buy the goods they want from providers. Uh, and the price system ensures that the right amount of each good ends up being provided. So for example, if there's a potato shortage, not enough potatoes to go around, the price of potatoes will rise and that will encourage farmers to grow more potatoes and that will alleviate the shortage. And similarly, if there's too much of some good, if there's a glut of housing units in Boston, the rent on these units will fall until potential renters uh, are willing to take up these units. So that's, that's how things should work. Of course, COVID-19 has interfered with the American economy in a big way. Uh, it's in particular interfered with many normal goods being provided. Just to take one example, uh, lots of people have not been able to uh, travel by air or uh, even if they could travel, they, they don't want to because they don't feel it's safe. Uh, and that means that uh, airlines have cut way back on the provision of airline flights. Well, cutbacks like these have also led to cutbacks in employment. The airlines don't need as many employees anymore. And that means that millions of people around the country in many sectors have lost their jobs. Uh, now, what I've talked about so far is, is dramatic and important, and it should also be quite familiar to, to all of you. We've, we've all read about these effects. I, I would actually like to concentrate on another effect of the pandemic, which is equally important, but perhaps a little bit more subtle. And that's the fact that in a pandemic, not all of the goods that we care most of, uh, uh, care most about, are provided well by the market system. So, so let me explain what I mean. 
suppose that I go to get myself tested for, for COVID. Now, this will obviously be a good thing for me because uh, if I'm positive, I can get appropriate treatment. And if I'm negative, well, that relieves uh, some psychological anxiety. Uh, but the, the thing I want to stress is that it actually benefits other people even more than it does me. Uh, and, and that's because if I'm positive, I can be isolated from other people so I won't in, infect them. Uh, so COVID goods are to a large extent what economists call a public good. Uh, they're a public good in the sense that most of the benefits accrue to the public at large, not to the person who was acquiring the good, in this case, acquiring a test. And public goods are quite different from private goods like potatoes. If I, if I eat more potatoes, that's not likely to affect other people much one way or the other. But uh, with public goods, uh, lots of other people are going to be affected. And the economic difference between private and public goods is that private goods like potatoes are provided well by markets, but public goods like COVID tests or personal protective equipment or vaccines uh, when they're finally available are not provided well by markets. And let, let me explain why not. Again, if I'm thinking about getting a COVID test, I may well disregard the, the benefit that that is conferring on others. Uh, so if I'm paying for the test, the amount that I'm willing to pay will be typically a lot less than the social benefit I would be creating. Uh, even if I'm not paying for it, even if it's my insurance company or my employer who is paying for the test, the amount that they're willing to pay is going to be considerably less than the benefit that is going to all those people beyond the insurance company and beyond the employer. So that the, up, the upshot of all of this is that there won't be enough COVID tests paid for from the standpoint of society. Society is, would be getting this huge benefit, but nobody, nobody is willing to pay for that benefit. Uh, and that means that we have to go beyond markets to find a solution. One way of solving this problem is for the government to step in. The government could buy huge amounts of COVID tests, protective equipment, vaccines, and then turn around and resell all of these goods to citizens or resell them to insurance companies or employers at much lower prices or, or even for free. And then the third part is that government should require that citizens actually use these goods. Now, has something like this been done before? Absolutely. Uh, this was the solution, the American solution to education beginning in the 19th century. If, if I go to high school, of course, I get a personal benefit from that. For one thing, I can probably get a better job as a result. But most of the benefit of my education is going to society because in a democratic society like ours, we need educated citizens. The, the, the system doesn't work without educated citizens. Uh, so I strengthen democracy by getting educated. So it was, it was realized a long time ago that it was important for government to offer free public education to all children. And furthermore, it was important for government to require children to get educated, not necessarily in the public system, but one way or another. That lesson, unfortunately, has not been applied to COVID. Uh, I think this is one of the greatest failures in our country's uh, response to COVID, the fact that we have not treated 
these important COVID goods as public goods and, and have the government get involved in a big way. We have lost an awful lot as a result in, in lives, in uh, damage to our economy. It's not too late, of course, to, to do something about it. And let's hope that we will soon be changing course. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Um, really fascinating. Opens up many questions. Um, the, the most obvious one might be what, why you think we haven't been able to treat COVID tests and other interventions as a public good. And is that politics or is that the way markets are problematic sometimes? So. Uh, I think that the problem is largely political, that, that, that if we had uh, better political leadership, particularly at the federal level, we could have moved much faster to, to provide COVID tests. E even today, uh, many months after the onset, the uh, testing is, in, is inadequate in general. We should be doing much more on a, on a daily level. And we can't expect this to be done automatically because as I was arguing, individuals, insurance companies, employers don't have sufficient incentive to do it on their own. The government really should have been involved in a big way. Now, we do have a tradition in this country um, of individualism, people making their own decisions and not have not not uh, having government interference. But there are, and there should be important exceptions to that rule. I I I think the general principle that individuals should have autonomy. Is, is great and it's one reason why our economy has done so well in general. But in emergencies like that, like, like the one we're experiencing now, um, it, uh, it does not always serve us well. Yes. Yeah. Let me try one other question, um, which is one of the things is markets work well as you sort of suggested, perhaps for potatoes. But one of the big debates of our time, even going back before the COVID pandemic, is that they don't work so well in areas of health and healthcare, hospitals and insurance. So is one way of looking at the COVID pandemic and the issues of preparedness that there were already certain market failures in the area of healthcare, accessibility to healthcare, that made us less prepared for the kinds of decisions that would need to be made during the pandemic? Uh, I, 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 think, I think that's right. Re relative uh, to many other countries, uh, we, um, We, we tend to treat healthcare as just one more good along with potatoes. And we can get away with that, at least to some extent uh, in, in normal times. But, but again, when, when, the, when the healthcare system is strained, as it has been strained this year, uh, the deficiencies in that approach become uh, all the more obvious. One of the themes that we've had is that pandemics make, you know, already existing problems much sharper and clearer and visible. And this would be an example perhaps of that. So. I, uh, I, I, th I think that's right. And, and with luck, that will be a catalyst for for change. Uh, if, if, if we can learn uh, from our mistakes, uh, then uh, we'll all feel a lot better uh, uh, 
about what has happened. Yeah. Thank you um, for sharing that and um, to Alan's Q&A with Professor Maskin. Um, I think that's a perfect segue to our next conversation with Professor Dine, and particularly this role of the federal government when you have a public health emergency of this scale. So we're thrilled to hear from you, Professor Dine. Thank you. I'm going to share some slides. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, you're nodding your head. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about the recession in this country and uh, what I'll call US economic policy. And I should be clear, I'm going to be talking about kind of the normal policies we use to fight recessions. Um, and that in this case, I entirely agree uh, with Professor Maskin that public health policy is um, just as important to the economy as is normal traditional economic policy. So I'm gonna make, um, make five points quickly. Uh, so first point being the US economy saw a historically large and sharp plunge in economic in activity last spring. Um, I probably don't need to say much about this, but I find uh, this graph here to capture uh, that particularly well. It's showing the percent change in employment as you move out months from the peak. Um, for the current recession that's in red versus historical recessions. And you just see how unprecedented this episode it has been. Uh, the shutdowns and other steps to contain the virus just left, led to an economic collapse that was much sharper and deeper than what we've seen in the past, including the Great Recession, which we saw a dozen years ago. Point two is that the initial monetary and fiscal policy responses were really massive. And um, starting with monetary policy, uh, you all may know that the Federal Reserve very quickly stepped in and cut rates uh, to zero. But I would say more importantly than that, they have put huge amounts of liquidity into the financial system. So basically they bought bonds and they've done other types of lending that's caused this jump in their balance sheet, which you see in the graph here. But in doing so, the Fed managed to quell panic in financial markets that otherwise might have greatly amplified the economic fallout like it did in 2008. And um, when I was in, in Washington, uh, we used to always say that um, people like to give awards for um, things that people create or, or do. And uh, we don't tend to recognize the things that people stopped from happening. But I have to say here, the Fed deserves a big award for um, basically avoiding something that could have been even more terrible for our economy. Um, let me turn now to fiscal support. And by this, I mean taxes and spending. Uh, we enacted a large amount of fiscal support. This is a visual from the Congressional Budget Office that captures the different measures that we deployed. Uh, the size of the box corresponds to how much money we spent on that measure. So um, you can see in this graphic some of the well-known parts of the fiscal response, including the paper. Paycheck Protection Program, which was aimed at uh, small businesses. It provided loans that converted to grants under the condition that they maintained employment. You can see this expansion of our unemployment insurance benefits, uh, which was very important in the lower left, $600 per week supplementary benefits. Plus, um, and I don't think this gets talked about enough, an expansion to groups that don't normally get covered like workers in the gig economy and part-time mm -hmm. workers. Um, you can see the recovery rebates, that's the stimulus checks and other important pieces, uh, you know, such as increased money for hospitals, some extra money for state and local localities, some money for food stamps and so on. So that's, that's basically kind of what we did in terms of a fiscal response. There's, you know, it, it sounds like there are kind of these different complicated elements of it, but really there are um, kind of several unifying themes. So the, the three goals really were disaster relief. So reducing immediate hardship, um, fiscal stimulus, which is kind of what we think of um, policy doing in traditional, traditionally in response in recessions, which just means supporting overall demand so that firms would continue to group, 
uh, produce and keep workers on payroll. Uh, and then thirdly, limiting economic scarring. And what I mean here is avoiding damage to economic structures that could prolong the recovery or permanently reduce what the economy can produce. So, you know, along these lines, you know, wiping out households financially, uh, you know, state and local budget strains that lead to huge cutbacks, widespread business failures, all of these things would represent forms of economic scarring. So fiscal policy is trying to meet these three goals, I would say relative to past recessions, I think goals one and three were um, perhaps uh, viewed as a bigger deal, at least early on, uh, you know, relative to the traditional fiscal stimulus. Okay, so, um, you know, how does this compare to what we've done in the past? The fiscal response so far has been comparable in size to what we did during the Great Recession. But as you can see here, it was much more front loaded than in that episode. So you can see for this year, we're hitting the economy with 12% of GDP in terms of the amount of spending, which is kind of much more than what we did in the Great Recession. Although what you can also see in this graph is that really it's just about what's happening this year. In fact, most of it has actually been deployed and there's not much going forward relative to the Great Recession. Point number three, this policy response drove an initial pickup in economic activity that was in fact stronger than many economists expected. So um, we all know the news on the economy has been bad news, but um, I think it's important to recognize that we thought it might be even worse when we were sitting around in April, kind of writing down forecasts of the economy. So here's what I mean. We saw this really remarkable jump in after-tax income despite massive job loss, which is pretty striking. Um, as a result of this, consumer spending on goods snapped back. So you can see what's called core retail sales here. Um, not true for services, of course, because services require interacting with other people. So a lot of people remain, their services spending remains subdued, but this is actually pretty striking for an economy that's in recession. Um, and then I think it's really important to recognize the distributional consequences of this recession. Um, low income workers, they were hit just much harder by job loss than other parts of the economy. Um, but strikingly, because of this fiscal stimulus, we saw poverty initially decline. That's what you see uh, in, on the left here, a meaningful decline in the poverty rate. Um, and then equally striking, striking we've, saw, we've seen uh, the spending of low income households basically hold up. So this is uh, a graph uh, from uh, my colleagues uh, who uh, work at Opportunity Insights, but you can see that consumer spending in low income zip codes uh, is about kind of on par right now with where it was in January, 2020, which is a really striking thing given what we know has happened to employment in this economy. Um, so that's kind of all the good news. Um, let me turn to kind of the caveats and the bad news. So uh, my point four is that the recovery has been only partial and its pace is slowing. So uh, you really just need to look at the employment data to see that story. This is a graph of employment, non-farm payrolls. And basically you can see the plunge in April you can see this rapid bounce back in the months following April, but um, and that that bounce back is terrific that we've seen millions of jobs created or recreated. But you can see that we're still down by 10 million jobs from where we were in February. So we've only dug halfway out of the hole. OK, and then what you see on the right, which I would say is is concerning, given that is um, kind of the change in non farm payroll, so the change in employment. By month. And again, you can see kind of the really massive changes in June, July, and August. Um, but you can see kind of growth in jobs has slowed as we go month by month by month. Now it's down to something a little over 600,000 per month, which would be terrific in normal times. But you know, you can easily do the math to see that if you're creating 600,000 jobs a month, it takes a long time to get back 10 million jobs. So in terms of what's going on, uh, what we think is likely to happen going forward is that we think kind of the initial bounce back is done, 
and that um, the economy is going to look much more like a typical recession going forward. I put an illustrative graph on the left side of this chart here. Of course, there's a, a ton of uh, kind of uncertainty around this, this any forecast these days. But what you can see after this sharp bounce back, we see kind of much slower improvement towards kind of a normal economy. I know we started with this poll question as to when we think the economy is going to get back to normal. I would be in the 2022 or 2023 camp. I do think we're going to get back to the previous peak of output by the end of next year, but um, that's not the goal anymore because the economy is always is always growing. We want to get back to where it would be had there not been a pandemic. And what I will say is that the ultimate outcome will depend on uh, a few factors. So first of all, the evolution of the virus uh, and the vaccine and health policy, of course. Um, second, the degree of economic scarring. We talked about that. And then third, how much additional fiscal policy support we get. And this brings me to my last point which is that I think that without additional fiscal support, really our economic recovery is at risk of stalling. So the forecast I showed you in the last slide, a lot of economists when they're making that sort of forecast, they're counting on some more fiscal stimulus passed. Uh, as I showed you in an earlier slide, we had this initial burst of support, but really as we kind of go forward, there's not much left. Um, in terms of what the pressing fiscal needs are right now, we need more uh, federal funds to fill state and local budget holes. Uh, if that doesn't happen, states and localities will have to cut back both on pandemic related services, but also in the Great Recession, we saw them cutting back on important things like higher ed spending. Um, we need a continuation of expanded unemployment benefits, um, probably with a lower weekly supplement, but um, particularly given that the job loss, the permanent job loss, again, is, is kind of concentrated at kind of the lower end, which already was facing hardship. We need to do that. Um, we need more relief for businesses that are struggling now that would, but would be viable post-pandemic. And I've just put a couple of screenshots on the, on the slide to remind of headlines to remind you that uh, it doesn't really look that promising right now in terms of getting a lot more stimulus passed. So this is something we should all be concerned about. And um, this is just my, my final uh, slide uh, that basically kind of gets at um, what I think is, 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 is going on. And, um, uh, you, know, you know, we had this initially, um, I think, pretty successful policy response, but um, it's, it's waned and now we're starting to see the signs that really don't augur well for the future. So this is just um, uh, from a survey the Urban Institute did on the share of adults reporting food insecurity. And you can see that um, among those lost who lost a job, you can see the levels are, are high in terms of the share. You can see they, they fell uh, you know, after this fiscal stimulus was put in place, but now they've climbed back up to uh, where they were uh, before that, and I expect it to climb further. So that's all the remarks I have. Um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Dynan. Um, fascinating, fascinating data you presented, and I think this opens up a whole area of inquiry in, in many ways. I mean, I think the point you raised about limiting economic scarring is, is really fascinating. Um, it's not <clears throat> a term I, I was familiar with. So I think that's, um, it, it makes so much sense in terms of the, the policies that need to be enacted. And I, I wondered if you could just reflect for a moment with us, um, both the impact of that front-loaded economic stimulus that that had on that, but also your thoughts as you're discussing this waning response. What do you think is driving that at this moment? Is it just purely a decrease in spending from the federal government? Is it some of these public health measures that we're really trying to enforce more lockdowns and more social isolations? It, kind of what are the pieces in this puzzle that you think are driving us forward? Sure. Um, 
on the just on the, on the I want to say first on that kind of just the magnitude of the fiscal response. I I, I had a slide that was showing the Great Recession um, was what you know as a benchmark, and I said the amount was comparable but more spread out in the Great Recession. I should point out that we don't a lot of people don't think that response was was at all adequate because it took more than eight years to get back to full employment because we had this sort of economic scarring. Um, so on the scarring, um, I mean, you ask a good question as to uh, what, you know, the role of, of policy, fiscal policy versus the resurgence of the virus. Um, I mean, I think I imagine we'll be talking uh, about this a lot more, but it's it's really not clear to me as I kind of look at the literature and um, just even just look at uh, places that have seen uh, have been hurt uh, to different degrees and have had different degrees of actually formal shutdowns that there is a, a strong pattern, at least with regard to the formal shutdowns. Um, it, it, it would appear, um, you know, they've done things like they've looked at states that had stricter and laxer, you know, formal shutdowns. I think it's like Wisconsin and maybe Minnesota. And they look at kind of counties that are right next to each other. So counties that really look fundamentally very similar and have, a, have had a similar hit in terms of the virus. And what they see there is they see the economies are performing very similarly, suggesting that it's not the formal su shutdown. It really is the, the fear of the virus. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I can say that that's, that's kind of, you know, uh, my understanding that, um, you know, in terms of what's, you know, we should be worried about going forward, it, it's really the virus, not like whether we shut down the economy or not. Yeah. Um, I can also just say in terms of the fiscal response, I only showed one slide in the interest of time, but there are just many other indicators you can look at that show that, um, although things have gone pretty well at the lower end, it's getting worse. I mean, the poverty rate, I showed you a reduction, it's gone back to where it was. I expect it to, to get worse. If you look at kind of the savings of lower income households, one very heartening thing was early on, we saw an increase in like their checking account balances, which is just wonderful to see. But now you can see, particularly once the supplementary unemployment benefits stop, you can see those balances have gone down again. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Sobering, sobering um, information and critical to be thinking about. Um, and that I think brings us actually to our third speaker who has just joined us, Professor Gopinath. Um, I think this is again, another important segue here. Welcome, Professor Gopinath. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, we've just had a long discussion about the US federal response. So we're thrilled to have you come and, and speak to us about your role at the IMF and the global response right now. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so yes, um, I'm happy to share the views. I'm gonna talk just very briefly on what we're seeing in terms of the impact on the global economy, um, you know, across the groups of countries of advanced economies, emerging markets, low-income countries, the IMF's role, what we've been doing, and maybe end with something very quickly about what this crisis will, uh, will look like, what legacies will it leave uh, into the future. So I'm just gonna share a screen, but, um, Let's just have just a couple of slides. Okay, um, so this is a uh, a picture of the of the pandemic. I mean, first and foremost, this is the source of the crisis. Uh, and as we all know, uh, you know, there isn't a health solution, a medical solution of any kind, or, or a solution where we've learned how to live with the virus well enough that we can go back to living as normal. Now, there are exceptions. Uh, there are, for instance, countries like China and Vietnam, where, uh, where there's really no trade-off. You have um, uh, the pandemic very well controlled, and you have... Uh, you know, relatively speaking, fewer lives lost, and you have a research, you have a resurgence in economic activity. 
But uh, what we're seeing here, of course, is what we're living through now, which is a big increase in uh, COVID cases uh, around the globe. These are new confirmed cases. You see that in the left graph. So we're at uh, globally at a whole new record level. Uh, and again, if you look at the right graph, you see that in terms of confirmed deaths, also the numbers are high. But again, just to be clear, uh, that the number of confirmed deaths, um, and especially if you look at this country by country uh, and region by region, has not gone up at the same rate as the number of cases going up because everybody has learned how to live with the virus better. Uh, doctors and nurses know, have, know how to treat this uh, disease better. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the demographics of people who are being affected are now somewhat on the lower age side. And so that's been another uh, factor. Uh, but so the question of uh, what do we see in terms of uh, the impact on the different parts of the global economy, uh, you know, this firstly is an important variable. So when we look at the different parts of the world, you the severity of the pandemic uh, and a country's ability to arrest the spread of the pandemic is clearly one very important factor. Uh, and a second, uh, you know, for, uh, the, this is what you see, for instance, we, a number of variable that we track in terms of uh, mobility, because we're looking at very high frequency indicators, we want to know what's going on. So you can see, for instance, Google mobility, and if you look at the Germany, France, Italy, Spain, you see starting from around mid-September, mobility has gone down. That's true also in, in the UK. Uh, while on the other hand, in the US, relative to July, it's been uh, pretty flat. So the translation between the severity of the pandemic to, the, to mobility and then to economic activity is not one stable relationship. It varies across countries and it varies across time. So this is part of the challenge in trying to make up projections about what's going to happen. But there's no doubt that the most severe the, uh, the pandemic either because you're responding to it with lockdowns and that has a direct effect on, econ on bringing down economic activity, but also just the voluntary social distancing that comes about when you are uh, you know, living in a country where the risk of infection is high. The second um, variable is, I don't know if this is my right slide, no, that's unemployment. The second variable that varies across countries is the sectoral composition. So the impact on economies depends to an important extent on you know, the, the importance of contact intensive services sectors uh, in a country. So if you're a country that relies very heavily uh, on tourism and travel, and you know, examples like Spain or just entire countries like Maldives, um, you're, you're just getting much harder hit uh, because this is a virus, this is a crisis where uh, you know, people are not traveling and there is a fear of uh, uh, of infections and so people are staying, you know, the contact intensive so services sectors are getting hit much harder than the manufacturing sector. So again, so that's a second variable uh, that varies across uh, countries. Uh, and um, a third uh, important variable, actually there would say fourth. So there's a third important variable, which is uh, what was, what shape was your economy in coming into this crisis? So in terms of were you already a slowing economy? Were you already in financial distress? Did you already have too high levels of debt? All of that has an important effect. And also I should mention on the sectoral side, uh, it, you know, besides tourism and travel, also commodities exporters, uh, especially oil exporters uh, are being hard hit as oil prices plunged and they've recovered, but still well below pre-pandemic levels. And then the last factor, of course, is the policy response. Uh, and I can show you this. This is what the fiscal and monetary policy response has been around the world. Uh, what the left graph shows you is that for advanced economies, it's about uh, the spending so far has been about 20% of their GDP. If you look at emerging markets, that number comes down to 6%. And if you look at low income countries, that number comes down to 2%. So this is a very stark, a reminder of the fact that different parts of the world have just different amounts of resources to tackle this crisis. 
uh, and uh, that obviously is impacting uh, the response uh, in terms of how quickly economic activity can come back up. And it's also one of the reasons why we are uh, projecting greater divergence in economic prospects for emerging and developing economies relative to advanced economies. Now, again, we have to exclude China because China is quite the exception. It's one of those rare economies, large economies that's projected to grow in 2020 uh, as to everybody else is expected to project to shrink quite substantially. So given this heterogeneity in policy space and policy response, of course, an organization like the IMF uh, plays a very important role. So we've had um, unprecedented um, amounts of requests for financing. Uh, we have provided financial support to 81 countries. Uh, the vast majority of them have received emergency financing so that they can deal with uh, with the crisis immediately, uh, make sure that they're investing in health in health, and in health spending, make sure that uh, the vulnerable in their population get income to have maintain some basic livelihoods. Uh, and so uh, that's the, that is, for instance, one important way in which uh, the IMF is helping low-income countries uh, deal with this, you know, once or in a couple of lifetimes uh, crisis. The second uh, important way is is also that there are some countries that have come in with very high levels of uh, uh, debt, uh, and uh, you know some of that debt is owed to the IMF. And we've been providing uh, debt relief uh, now for for a 12 month uh, period. Uh, you know, this is not just a moratorium, this is actually relief. So that's the second way we're doing this. And so there are many instruments that we have in the financial end that we are deploying. Uh, second, of course, is uh, it's just our own policy advice on how to tackle this crisis. This is something that none of us had seen before, a pandemic driven crisis. It's a unique challenge for countries and we've been deeply involved with advising 190 member countries uh, on how to deal with uh, this very unique crisis in their economies. This is one of the very interesting features of being at the IMF is that you're not working in one country, but you're thinking about 119 countries in different parts of the world. And as, you, as I just mentioned, there is not, you know, the impact of this crisis on countries depends on all those four factors. And it's not as if there are neat buckets in which you can put uh, you, can, you can't just describe all advanced economies in one bucket and all low-income countries in a different bu bucket. So there is a great deal of heterogeneity and so tailoring our advice uh, has been very important. And of course, the third part of what we do, which is surveillance, which is precisely trying to understand where the world is headed. This is where we came out on our World Economic Outlook, uh, which I highly recommend you read in October we put out the fact that this, we see this as being a long, uneven and uncertain ascent, which means that it's going to take a while for the world as a whole to return back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and in fact, there is going to be somewhat of a, a permanent hit on economic activity relative to what was projected uh, pre-pandemic. So clearly looking forward, uh, coming out of this crisis, we there will be much more that needs to be done to build back a world that's not just more prosperous, but also more sustainable and more equitable. We are very worried about the rising inequality, about the increase in poverty rates around the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is why we put a bit, very important emphasis on infrastructure investment. This is infrastructure in green, education, health, um, ensuring that there are strong social uh, safety nets. Uh, and so that's the roles that we've played again coming forward in terms of the SCARS. Uh, you know, we, we have students around the world who uh, are losing out on schooling. You know, there's only a small fraction of the world can do distance learning. Uh, and while most cannot, and they're just hugely disadvantaged and this is going to have an effect on them. So we, you know, remedial measures will be needed. Uh, there's a big concern about jobs, uh, this pandemic has, you know, uh, shut down a lot of small and small scale enterprises. There's been job destruction. Uh, and, uh, you know, going forward, some of these sectors may never come back. Tourism may never come back in the exact same way. Travel may not come back the way we have. Most of us will not travel as much as we did. So people employed in these sectors are going to be uh, hit for a very long time. So how, so, um, you know, that's another area where we, 
we are very concerned about job creation, which is why we think public investment can play a very important role in terms of uh, job uh, generation. But also, again, like I said, building back better in terms of a greener world uh, that's also sustainable and more, uh, more equitable. So with that, uh, I will stop. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Gopinath. It's a incredibly important presentation and I have to say sobering. You know, one of the ways that the economic debate has been framed is kind of what the Trump administration typically referred to in earlier months as a V-shaped recovery. And it seems to me that both you and Professor Dinan are saying that there were elements of the stimulus and other immediate interventions that perhaps suggested those kinds of possibilities, especially in a rich country like the US, but that what we're also seeing are fundamental long-term impacts, especially on developing, growing economies, low-income countries. So I'm wondering as you see this, like you have tools at the IMF, national governments have tools that they can use, but is this different than anything we've seen? Is this really going to reshape global economies? One of the things I've been reading is that economies are likely to trade less and become more national, all of which presents threats to overall well being. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about this right now, given the, to the traditional tools we have to address what we might call traditional economic crises. So yes, this is um, a crisis like no other. It's firstly, like I said, it's a health, health crisis uh, and it's truly global. It's been truly global. Unlike the global financial crisis, which we say global financial crisis, but this is a, far, this is a truly global uh, crisis. And you know, the policy support works very differently in the sense that while, we are, while there's been a very large amounts uh, of close to $12 trillion that has been put in terms of fiscal policy support. A lot of that has been during a time when people have been told to stay home and not actually go engage in economic activity. So it's a very different kind of, uh, of a crisis for policymakers to deal with. So yes, uh, it's very hard to look, of, look at this recovery as a V-shaped recovery. In fact, we said this back in our first projections that we did in April, we said that it would look like a V initially and then it won't, which is that there, there would be, as you reopen economies, there will be an improvement from the pits of the collapse, but then it will take much longer to come back up to, uh, for many, many countries to pre-pandemic level. So I, I remember there were people who thought that this would happen in 2020 itself, you'd be back to pre-pandemic levels, but you know, with the exception of China, there's hardly a country that includes the US, despite the substantial policy support that's been deployed. Uh, and there are many regions in the world where this is going to take even longer. So if you look at Latin America, for instance, we don't have them and our projections returning back to pre-pandemic pre levels, even, by, even in 2022, it kind of gets around to 2023. So this is going far out. And I'm just talking in levels now, not even in per capita terms, which is what more, is more important, which is gonna take even longer. Uh, and for, in terms of cumulatively our loss to a global output in 2024, relative to what we had projected pre-pandemic is around 4%. So this is, this, this is a long, this is a long uh, uh, ascent. And now, of course, I also want to mention that, you know, every time we do this, there is an element which is how, how good are we going to be at getting this, at arresting this health crisis? And there's all this news that's coming in terms of vaccines and treatments that we keep following, which is again, something that economists have typically don't do. But now we, you know, we follow those very closely. So there could be upside scenarios where things get better much more quickly. A second important uh, concern of course, is what we're seeing in terms of divergence of prospects, right? So if you look at where we're projecting advanced economies in terms of their recovery, it's a stronger recovery as opposed to for most emerging and developing economies where the recovery is worse. So going forward, this is a world that will look more unequal uh, relative uh, to pre-pandemic. And again, there's sectoral transformation that's going on. 
Uh, besides uh, what I mentioned about travel, the travel sector, for instance, there's also now a big impetus for greater automation. And we know that one of the big reasons why there was a hollowing out of the middle and rising inequality in advanced economies was, auto I mean, was uh, automation technology played a very important role. Uh, and that's going to get a bigger boost. And so the question is, so, you know, that's going to make it more challenging for policymakers to ensure that we don't end up with even further uh, divergences uh, in inequality. So, and, and on the education front, as I mentioned before. So there are, um, you know, several of these issues and you mentioned on the trade front. So yes, I mean, this is precedes the, this uh, crisis. There's been a, 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 you know, a shift in, popular sentiment for the, in terms of policy sentiment, at least for the for global trade. Uh, we saw this increasing in tariffs before that, but just to be clear, I would not describe where we are now as, as showing smoking gun evidence of deglobalization. I, I, I would, globalization has slowed. There are very natural reasons why it should, it should slow, but there is absolutely the concern going forward about whether countries will get more protectionist, especially if they find that their labor markets are, uh, you know, that they cannot find enough employment, they, they're having a harder time getting back to full employment. Uh, or, and then there are, there's, I think at least during this period when thinking about vaccines and treatments, I, I worry about uh, restrictions on medical exports or ingredients exports. Uh, and so, so these are all issues that we need to, uh, we worry about. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, we have a lot of questions from students. So Yvonne, could you bring up some student questions? 